May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. The Gospel of Mark begins dramatically and with an intensity of pace which has an urgency about it. Within just those first seven verses that we read, this morning, verses 9 to 16, Jesus' geographical movement and the spiritual happenings are considerable. And there's very little, if any, reference to the amount of time that it takes or even some sort of breathing space in between. Jesus moves from Nazareth to Galilee to the River Jordan, close to Jerusalem, just in one verse. Verse 9. And then three verses later, the Holy Spirit has shifted him into the desert. And two verses later, he's back in Galilee, close to the Sea of Galilee. And so the gospel moves on, shedding any extraneous matters like the tedium of traveling in between. Instead, what Mark seems to do is hone in on the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter? Jesus' baptism into the fullness of humanity, his time of trial in the desert, his preaching, his calling of the disciples, the healing of a man with an unclean spirit. Jesus is a man with a God purpose. In a way, this feels something like what our journey through Lent, our pilgrimage into Lent is calling us into. To answer that question, what is it that really matters in our lives? And then to shed all that is extraneous, to hold onto the purpose and the meaning of our lives in Christ. Our Gospel today provides us with a number of valuable insights to hold on to throughout our relational pilgrimage with God on earth. Firstly, no matter what's going on in our lives, whether we're in that wonderful place of feeling very close to God, or whether our prayer lives are feeling dry and pointless, or God seems to have somehow disappeared off of our inner radar, or the whole world might feel as if the moral compass that it once had is now completely shattered. No matter where we are, what our experience is, the invitation always and unfailingly is to return to the immutable fact that God loves us. God loves each and every one of us. It's so interesting to note that even Jesus, the Son of God, experiences what so many of us can testify to in our own lives as well. That after a time of spiritual consolation, maybe that's just a, a brief time or it's a longer uh, time in our lives, for Jesus in this particular passage, his moment of consolation was his baptism. And so often after that consolation, what we can experience, not always, but often, is that it's followed by a time of desolation, a time of trial. In Jesus' case, this internal struggle is represented externally by Jesus being in the desert, tempted by Satan. At the time of Jesus' presence on earth, in the Jewish mindset, the desert would have been automatically seen as the abode of hostile forces, forces that were hostile to God and hostile to the human person. I wonder if this is part of what gave rise to that English description of some places being seen as God-forsaken places. Is that true? Is it true that there are spaces which God has just abandoned? Personally, I don't feel that's true. I do not feel that God has forsaken any place. Yes, there are spaces where great evil has been committed and there's an imprint of that evil in the atmosphere, but 
It doesn't mean that God is absent. It may just mean that God is waiting to minister into that space through whoever is open and available to God to use them to do so. How do we know that even in so-called hostile places where there's this imprint of evil, how do we know that God hasn't deserted that space? Well, we hear that even in this desert place, the angels ministered to Jesus, and angels are often a code for God's presence. Surely that also means that God's presence cannot ever be ousted by Satan or evil. God is far more powerful than that. What is fascinating is that in that same verse where we read about the angels ministering to Jesus, there's also a reference that Jesus is among wild beasts. What's that about? On a literal level, in the wilderness of that area in those days, and actually quite a few of them still exist, there were some pretty dangerous animals. What kind of animals are we talking about? Well, I did some research. There were things like the Asiatic lion, Syrian brown bear, antelope, crocodile, hippopotamus, and the Judean desert leopard, just to name a few. So those were not just wild, we know they're also very dangerous. So this mention alongside the angels, is it somehow to show God's provision of protecting Jesus, that these angels were guardian angels who made sure that Jesus stayed safe? And I'm sure that there are some of us here present today who've either heard stories or ourselves experience the activity of God's guardian angels. The Hebrew scriptures, what we sometimes call the Old Testament, has numerous examples of the activity of the angels of the Lord that are sent to guard and protect humanity. Psalm 91 writes, For he commands his angels with regard to you, to guard you wherever you go, with their hands they shall support you. And then there's that amazing, almost soap opera-ish, apocryphal book called Tobit, in which the angel Raphael is assigned to protect Tobiah throughout this very dramatic story. Jesus himself talks about angels. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, he says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. And he was referring to a child, but of course we are all children of God. Do not despise them, for I say to you that their angels in heaven always look upon the face of our heavenly Father. And then there are angels associated with St. Peter when he was in prison in Acts chapter 12, verse 15. Angels opened up the prison gates, the doors, and Peter was able to escape and he runs away in the night to the home of Mark's mother. Some of the house guests who were there present don't believe that it's Peter himself in the flesh standing at the door. They think it's Peter's angels. So obviously they were very familiar with angels. Now it's, it's probably too true that most of us won't physically with our own eyes see our guardian angels this side of heaven, but that doesn't mean that we don't have one. We do. We're told that God provides us each with the guardian angels, and I have no doubt that our guardian angels are very active, and hopefully, for the most part, we do listen to their promptings, and that we actually cooperate with their protection of us. So then, we also need to ask ourselves, but what if those angels that were there with Jesus in the desert were there not to protect Jesus? What if they had a different role? What if they were there to provide Jesus with some food and some drink at the end of his 40 days in the desert, which is also possible. We know angels also did that. Some 
of the Bible translations, when they talk about the wild beasts, actually say that the wild animals were companioning Jesus. So then the angels didn't need to protect Jesus. And in that case, what is that about? If the animals were Jesus' companions? Well, that's a very harmonious image, isn't it? And we, there are remarkable stories about little babies playing with snakes and being completely unharmed. What are we meant to understand by that, that peaceable living together? Well, it's meant to, and certainly Mark would have expected us as readers to understand that this is a reference back to Genesis. That paradisical quality of the Garden of Eden is brought to mind with Jesus living in harmony with the animals and which was of course shattered by the arrogance and disobedience of humans. And that's what created this enmity and this fear between God's creatures and all of us as part of God's creatures and all sorts of things like aggression and division, sorrow and confusion enters into the creation story. And then Jesus arrives on the scene, God's Son incarnate. And many of the people who write in the New Testament look at Jesus as the second Adam or the completion, the last Adam. And Jesus is the Adam who is completely obedient and he manifests and restores the hope of a new Eden, a new or transformed creation. And with this manifest obedience of Christ to God, reality is once again completely reconfigured. Jesus incarnate in this world, the old ways and the previously held expectations are being turned on their heads. Jesus' presence over 2,000 years ago and now is the enfleshed revelation of God breaking in on this earthly reality, a real living proclamation of the dawn of a new era, dawn of a new state of affairs in which God rules. So what's gone wrong? Because on the whole it looks as if God's on holiday. We don't feel very much as if God is ruling on earth when there's so many devastating and monstrous things that are still happening. I'm not sure that I can give a full and complete answer to that question. There's still so much that is hidden from our eyes and our understanding. However, what I do know is that God is not a benevolent tyrant who sets things right on our high without any consultation or co-creation with any of us. It is precisely within the relationality of collaboration that God sets things right. That's the key. God relates to all of creation, including ourselves. Without us, God's instigation of a new harmonious creation cannot be fully realized. Yes, of course, we're all blessed with those idyllic moments when we occasionally glimpse a sight of this restored earth. However, they aren't as prolific as you and I would want. And that's because we still do not always pay attention to those promptings where God is asking us to collaborate and manifest that restoration. But when we see them, let's treasure them, let's value them as part of the ongoing story of a new Eden that was begun in our Lord Jesus. And so in conclusion, I'd like to read a wonderful poem written by Jan Richardson that draws some of these strands together. And it is entitled, Beloved is where we begin. If you would enter into the wilderness, do not begin without a blessing. Do not leave without hearing who you are, beloved. 
named by the one who has traveled this path before you. Do not go without letting it echo in your ears. And if you find it is hard to let it into your heart, do not despair. That is what this journey is for. I cannot promise you this blessing will free you from danger, from fear, from hunger or thirst, from the scorching sun or the fall of the night. But I can tell you that on this path there will be help. I can tell you that on this way there will be rest. I can tell you that you will know the strange graces that come to our aid only on a road such as this, that fly to meet us bearing comfort and strength, that come alongside us for no other cause than to lean themselves toward our ear and with their curious insistence whisper our name. Beloved, beloved, beloved. Amen.